thank you, worship team, for that amazing worship this morning. Uh, I really do appreciate it personally. Um, as many of you know, <laughs> this is my first time ever standing in a pulpit uh, attempting to accurately and hopefully bring glory to God's name, you know, represent the truth of his spirit, the truth of his glory, the truth of his word to you all. And so please be praying for me as I'm standing here before you. Um, <laughs> greetings uh, to Pastor Aaron. He and his family are taking some much needed time off. Uh, heading down south, he's going to put up his feet. So please be praying for them, uh, you know, that they are able to relax and break away and disengage. Uh, the way God has called them to do so and get recharged, re-energized. They are doing some amazing things for us, the body here at Antioch, you know, both here in the sanctuary and those of you who are watching abroad. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, not really sure where you're uh, seeing us from, but uh, I am not as well-traveled as our dear Pastor Aaron, so I'm going to give you a hearty, hey, how y'all doing this morning from Augusta, Georgia? Um, that's what I know best. That's where I'm comfortable right now, and so that's what I'm going to give you. In an attempt to do a message this morning, uh, Pastor Aaron called me in a traditional Antioch fashion. You know, we, we believe in trial by fire here. He called me yesterday and he's like, hey, brother, how would you like to do the word tomorrow? My first inclination, my first response in my spirit was I will not. I will not like to do it. But, um, but in remembering why God called me here and remembering that I chose to, I submitted to God's calling on my life to come and study here and to submit to his leadership. I was like, well, you know, if I trust this man and that he's hearing the word of God and that he's hearing from God via the Holy Spirit, then if he feels inclined to ask me to deliver a message today, then it must be God because he knows, God knows that I am woefully inadequate, that I am woefully insecure. But if God is sending a message through this man <laughs> that I am ready, then surely God will fill my mouth as I open it. And so as I'm standing here, I would like to open us in prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you for being here with us today, Lord God. Thank you for being ever-present, omniscient, omnipotent, Lord God. And I thank you that you do not have to, to have me to rehearse my inadequacies, my insecurities before you, Lord, but I thank you so much that all you're asking is that I be available and that I be willing, Lord God. And so as I am willing, Lord God, as I'm available, Lord God, as the people who are under the sound of my voice this morning, as they are willing and as they are available, Lord God, we ask that you fill us, Lord God, with your spirit. We ask that you fill us, Lord God, with your word, Lord God, and we thank you. We come to you with a spirit of thanksgiving and gratitude this morning, Lord God, for your son, Jesus Christ, for his sacrifice, Lord God. But we also thank you for your word. Lord God, we thank you that an omniscient, omnipotent, Lord God, all-seeing, all-knowing God desires to be with his children, to rest among his children, Lord God, not only to rest among them, Lord God, but to work in them, to work through them, Lord God, and to work around them. And Lord God, I thank you for the man of God that is Pastor Aaron, Lord God, who reminded us of that yesterday. God is looking to do something in you. He's looking to do something through you, and he's looking to do something around you, and he is indeed doing that. And so, God, as we remember that today, Lord God, I just ask that the power of the Holy Spirit fall heavy in this place today for those who are here in the sanctuary and for those who are listening right now and for those who will be listening later. God is in your Son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So in my attempt to get ready for today, I think in my pride and in my own self-importance, the first thing I wanted to do was rehearse to God just how much I don't know, just how much I am not ready, just how much he has made the wrong decision in choosing me to deliver a word today. And so <laughs> I found myself laughing a little bit last night because even as I got the call while we were still here at the church, I'm driving in my car trying not to cry my eyes out because I just felt like it was not time. I am not ready. And for some reason, the small, still voice, and I know it was the Holy Spirit, is like, Fred, I made you in my image. If I created you after my likeness, then surely I have equipped you to do the very thing that I've called you to do. And so I was like, okay, God, you've equipped me. What exactly did you equip me with? <laughs> How will you have for me to use it? And when will be, 
the time? When is the right time for me to, to step into that, Lord God, knowing that you've created me to do all of these great and mighty things, knowing that you, in you know, all of your glory, you're great, you're mighty. So it's, is it right that I can even say, God, you created me to do great and mighty things? And so, again, just in my own head, rehearsing my own inadequacies, my own insecurities, I just found myself like, okay, I can get out of my head. And the first thing that I should be doing, that I should do, is go to the scriptures. And I was like, if anything else, if everything else fails, if nothing else that I say rests with you guys today, always remember that we're, we're in the word, we're in the scripture. The scripture is always relevant. <laughs> my personal anecdotes, my personal testimony, I hope it's a blessing. But the scripture is always relevant. So I pray that you hear the scripture and have God, through the Holy Spirit, interpret it to you uh, the way that he has for it. Um, and so, yeah, you know, I would like to title this message, What Are You Asking God? Now, originally the title was going to be, What Are You Asking God For? But I think in my own weakness, a lot of times I want to kind of go into the, the name and claim it theology that a lot of us are, are we've been made more aware of how that's a bit fatalistic in, in our theology. And so I was like, okay, God, well, well, all right, where are you leading me? Like, I'm asking a lot of questions. I'm pretending like I'm waiting to hear from you to share with me what it is that you have for me to share with myself and with the people that you're having me talk to today. And that's exactly where he had me to start. It's like, well, what exactly are you asking me? An all-knowing, all-seeing, all-powerful God, what exactly are you asking me? Because surely, as you read my word, as I'm filling your mouth, you do know that I am going to show up. Um, and so, yeah, I was like, okay, well, um, all right, well, show me exactly, like, who, who, who did you create me to be? Who did you model me after? How can I see myself in scripture? And so I'm going to rattle off a list of scriptures uh, that I feel like God spoke to me yesterday, and it literally started as a, okay, this is the scripture that I remember hearing in context somewhere else. Let me just Google it, find it in the Bible, and then write it down. So I started with Exodus 4.12. Uh, next, we're going to move to Psalms 81.10, 2 Chronicles 7.14, Numbers 11.1, 1, uh, Acts 7.51, and I'm going to try to bring it home succinctly and, and, and or reference 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And so, again, in, in rehearsing my inadequacies and in rehearsing my insecurities, I was just like, God, how have you even prepared me for a day such as this one? I was like, I'm not as eloquent at, at exegeting the word like a Pastor Aaron, so how am I supposed to engage the word? How am I supposed to engage the the tools and the, the, what is it, the commentaries that he's recommended for us to get for ourselves. And so it, it, he took me all the way back to elementary school. And I don't know if you all recall, recall but doing um, book reports in elementary school, our teachers would always encourage us to answer the, the questions, you know, who, what, when, where, why, and how. Right, the journalistic questions. The who, what, when, where, why, and how. And I was like, okay, God, well, what am I supposed to do with that then? And so I found myself engaging in a, a, a bit of a traditional Socratic method where it's just like, okay, the more I ask questions, the more questions I had to ask. And I remember as I'm reading scripture, I found myself, I, I've been diving into Acts recently, you know, and I found myself identifying with Peter and his self-righteousness. He was eloquent, he was well-spoken, but the dude was self-righteous, you know. So God bringing him alongside a tanner and understanding culturally why that was prohibited because tanners were considered unclean or unceremonially, uh, ceremonially, ceremonially unclean. Um, and so I was like, okay, you know, so there's a, a humility aspect, but in waxing humble, I was like, okay, well, let me just dive into the scriptures and let me start with Exodus. And I found myself identifying with Moses. Now, much to my chagrin, Moses was a man who like me, was woefully aware of all of his inadequacies and his insecurities. And I came across a Wearsby commentary that really spoke to me on a very deep and intimate level, and I would like to read it for you today, or just a couple lines from it. It's like, Moses was making the mistake of looking at himself instead of looking at God. 
was Moses manifesting an attitude of pride or true humility. Forty years before, he felt perfectly adequate to face the enemy and act on behalf of his people, but now he's backing off and professing himself to be a worthless failure. But humility isn't thinking poorly of ourselves. It's simply not thinking of ourselves at all, but making God everything. The humble servant thinks only of God's will and God's glory, not his or her own inadequacy, success, or failure. Moses was clothing his pride and unbelief in a hollow confession of weakness. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> in my attempt to just, you know, wax humble in front of God, and it's like, God, you know what, man? I don't know what I'm doing. I cannot do this. I, 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 me, 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 I, me, I, me, 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 I. <laughs> and finally, he just stopped me in my tracks. He's like, okay, I know who you are. I know who I created you to be. And I know for, that you're woefully inadequate. And that's why I'm putting you in front of my people. That's why I'm putting you in front of yourself today. I'm ministering to you, Fred, just as much as I'm ministering to the people that are under the sound of your voice. Get out of your own head and stop thinking about yourself. And give my people what, you have called, what I've called for you to give them. And so it took me to Exodus 4.12, and uh, as I've been studying, I understand more and more how pastors say, as I'm preaching to you, I'm preaching to myself. God is blessing me tremendously, and I've learned this new profound way to, to engage the word and to really fall in love with it and not be afraid to see yourself in it, the good and the bad. Um, in Exodus 4.12, uh, and these are quoted from the King James Version, now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. Whoa. <laughs> For me, I, I, I feel like, you know, we as Christians sometimes, we get in our own heads and we forget that the very God who created us in his image fills our mouths. I think that sometimes we forget that the very God who created us in his image knows what he put in us. And all he wants is for us to just make ourselves available to the work that he is doing in us. And so I was like, okay, God, well, who am I? What am I? When am I supposed to be there? Where am I going? How am I supposed to do this? And why? Why me? Uh, he's like, again, you're asking all the wrong questions, so self-centered, but it's okay. I know who you are, and I know you're selfish, so I'm going to deal with you in that. Then he took me to... Psalms 81.10, and it's like, you know, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Open thy mouth wide, and I will fill it. And then I was thinking, okay, I love the reference to how God had delivered his children from Egypt. How God, in his might, in his love, showed them all of these great and mighty works, and they still fail to remember. And in my recollection of these things, I found that in my self-righteousness, I was standing in judgment of the children of Israel. He's like, Fred, instead of standing in judgment of the children of Israel, communicate, <laughs> allow the Holy Spirit to communicate to you how you are like them. Allow the Spirit of God to communicate to you how the very people that you're speaking to, hey, we're all meeting God in a very new and profound and, and effective way. But remember, remember, remember that it's always God doing the work. And so I was like, okay, all right. And I love the fact that we do not run the risk of running out of God's grace in this area. Because as we have the, the, the example of the children of Israel, again, you have to be careful not to stand in judgment of them, but also, but, but be diligent and vigilant to see yourselves in how the children of Israel were conducting themselves. <laughs> and so with that, I was like, all right, God, being self-centered again. What are you saying? What are you doing? I know that, and, and we should make the, the correct assumption that we serve a God who is all-powerful and who loves his children. We were learning in theology class last year that God's purpose is to always communicate his love to his children. Even when we find ourselves in struggles, when we find ourselves in, in kind of just confusion or insecurities and whatnot, God doesn't, he's not the author of these things, but he wants to meet us in those things and, and show us the greatest ex exhibition of how he loves us, even in those things that make us uncomfortable. Um, I, and also preparing and praying recently, I just remember 
you know, God isn't always going to send down fire from heaven. Sometimes he's going to whisper to you in a small, still voice. And actually, the other day I was riding in the car with my fiance, and she was like, you know, I hear you talk about this particular thing all the time. And every time you bring it up, you complain. <laughs> and you, you know, you keep mentioning this one thing. And in the love, she was really sharing some really hard truths for me to hear. And I was like, well, you know, it, <laughs> it wouldn't be that way if people just kind of fell in line. You know, again, self-righteous, kind of arrogant. And, um, and so I was like, okay, I complain a lot then, God. Well, what does your word say about complaining? How do you respond to complaining? And honestly, I was not ready and willing to read what God was saying about complaining in his word. And so he took me to Numbers 11. And I think that was probably the best exhibition of God's might and God's love I've seen thus far um, exhibited kind of concurrently for me. Uh, Numbers 11, 1, and when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. Sounds pretty doggone daunting to me. It reminded me of my own complaining, of my own unbelief, of my own pride. And I think about how... <laughs> As I'm complaining, even God, as he's taking things away and adding things, he's like, yo, don't complain because you're, you're, you're kindling that against me. Praise God for Jesus Christ. <laughs> Praise God for how we have the great intercessor standing in the gap on our behalf because in thinking about how God sent fire from heaven to burn the outermost parts of their encampment, I think sometimes we look so much at the wrath of God in that, that we forget that God's love is, well, excuse me, backing up a little bit. God's wrath is an encounter of God's love and sin. We learned that last year in theology class as well. And I think about how even in sending down fire from heaven to burn the outermost courts or the outermost, excuse me, the outermost encampment, if we can recall how God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, they were moving in mass, and it wasn't just the children of Israel that were enslaved and in bondage in Egypt. There were other denominations, or if you will, other cultures that left with them. Those rabble rousers, if you will, were the ones who were dwelling on the outermost excerpts of the court. And they were the ones that were facilitating the displeasure and the clamoring and, mur uh, and, and murmuring and complaints that the children of Israel were taking on as their own belief. And so in God's love for Israel, he was like, listen, you're kindling my anger against you. <laughs> I'm going to remove that which is angering you against me and show you even, in as, even as I remove that, as I, I address that issue, I'm still loving you beyond measure because I'm showing you my might, but I'm also showing you my love. I will not touch you, but the very thing that's incensing you against me, oh, I'm getting rid of that. That's going to be removed. And so it made me think about my own complaining. Well, God, what am I complaining about? How am I allowing out external things to, to, to allow for me to forget how good you've been to me, how good you've been to those around me, how good I've seen you operate and function in this world? And so in asking for that kind of correction and asking for that kind of boldness uh, and brokenness even, God taught me not to fear when he shows me his wrath in the word. And so... Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's always, okay, God, well, here we are again, this good old question and answer circuit that I like to go on, this good old question and answer circuit that reflects more my unbelief and my own pride than my willingness to submit to your will for my life. Then next, you know, uh, he took me to, what is that, Second Chronicles seven fourteen. Now, this is the first time where I felt like I've tried to successfully exegete the word, you know, get you some of that, that hearty, good old Duke University learning that I took so long to get. Um, Second Chronicles 7, 14, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will then hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. 
And so I was like, okay, Pastor Aaron talks a lot about using scripture to interpret scripture. And I was like, oh, wow. And for some reason, the word turn just jumped right out at me. I was like, well, let me go to the knaves and the whatever else it's called, <laughs> um, the Nelson's Illustrated Bible, all of those. And I was like, I got them all. You know, we spent good money on these things. Let's try to use them. Let's try to, to, to pull up blueletterbible.org. Let's try to use it all. It's all available to me. And I found even in preparing for today, I've experienced a new level of brokenness. Because the word is so rich. It is so expansive. It's so life-giving. I found that the, the real struggle now is not focusing so much on me and my inadequacies, but God, like, you're so great. How do I even contain the message that you've given me to 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes? Uh, and so he took me to Acts 7.51, and here we see Stephen admonishing the people of Jerusalem. And so I was like, okay, what are you telling me here, Lord? And he's like, well, you stiff-necked and stubborn people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you are always actively resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did. And what I love about Stephen's story is that he wasn't doing anything outside of what God called him to do. All he did was rehearse the very history that the people of Jerusalem were actually familiar with themselves. They were so familiar with it, in fact, that before they martyred him, they knew that it was the law or it was Jewish law, Jewish tradition, not to murder or execute anyone within the walls of Jerusalem. And so I think a lot of times in how we execute our day-to-days, how we, we go about living our own life, sometimes we forget that we have access to God's word, that we have access to God's law, that we have access to God's precepts. And even in their execution of Stephen, they knew enough not to execute him within the walls of Jerusalem. And so again, we go back to this, this good old back and forth of asking who, what, when, where, why, and how. It's like, well, I've given you everything that you need. Going back to Moses, Moses was so concerned with how influent he is and how you know, he just didn't have everything that he needed. It's like, well, I've given you a staff. I've given you Aaron. God, his first response was to remind him of what he had been equipped with, what he had been given. And so I think about like, how even the people who martyred Stephen, like they had the law. They had truth. All they had, they, they, all the, 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 the one thing that they were holding on to was their own pride, and that's what caused them to drive Stephen out of the city before they killed him unjustly. And, and you see there that that's an exhibition of their own pride. Like, I know the law. I know that I have access to God. I know that I know God better than he knows himself. Whoa, 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 you know. Because if you feel like or if you know God the way that you think you do, then you, you, you know, you think that you'd be a little more yielding. And trust me, I'm, I'm being as self-righteous and judgmental toward myself, and I'm learning to pull that back. But I just, uh, I don't know, the scripture is so rich. And I was like, okay, God, well, as I'm up there, like, as I'm speaking, you got you got to do this. Like I'm, you know, I don't want to be a, a, a Pharisee or a citizen of the city of Jerusalem, driving out the very people that you've sent to be a blessing to me. So how am I to learn from them? When do we meet? Why are we meeting? And I think a lot of times we've been led to feel like it's not okay to go to God in prayer and ask these questions. And I think all the more for me, it's more pleasing to God that I do ask. He rather I ask and still myself and allow for him to, to, to back me up and, and sit at his feet to receive his wisdom, to receive his Holy Spirit so that in the event that I do decide to engage the boldness that he's called me into to share his word, it will come from a confidence that's not Fred-given, that's God-given. It will come from a confidence that's not Antioch-given, it's God-given. And so I would encourage us to remember that, yo, as God is calling you forward, remember that you have access, you have every single thing you need. And I think that's the thing that brings me the most comfort. Even in preparing for today again, I just went through the scriptures and I was like, God, if everything that I say, if all of my personal anecdotes fall on deaf ears, at very least on this side of things, they will have the scriptures. They will know to reference the scriptures, to see them in their context, to pray to you first, to ask for the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord God, to reveal to them exactly what you are saying to them through your word. Uh, 
I think there was another instance, and I say I think because I, don't, I try not to speak with absolute assurance about anything uh, until I've watched it through the Word and through the Holy Spirit. But um, just before I left this morning, I was taken to 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And here you see Paul, after he's been afflicted, it's like, and he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I'm not really sure why that hit me in a very different way. I'm, and, and like most of you who've probably been in the faith for a while, I know that you've heard that before, and I know that you've heard it referenced in several different ways, in many different ways. And so I was just like, all right, God, well, what, what is that supposed to say to me today? Because I've heard it before, I've seen it before, read it before, prayed about it before, boasted in it before. And so then he took me back to when Moses was, rehearsing his own inadequacies when rehearsing what he thought were his weaknesses. It's like, well, God, well, what's the difference between Moses and Paul? They were both talking about what they didn't have, where they were inadequate, where, where they were insecure. Like, what, what exactly is the difference? And I think the one thing, the one thing that I remember is that Moses... His, his explanation of his inadequacies, his explanation of his, his deficiencies and his insecurities, it was thinly veiled pride and unbelief. Whereas Paul, he had an encounter with God that yielded a weakness that he gave completely over to the Lord. And he was like, okay, God, well, if this is my infirmity, if this is my affliction, then surely it is you who is going to be made great in my weakness. Then surely it is you who is going to remind me of my weakness and exalt yourself above anything that I can say or do. Surely it is you who is ordering my steps. Surely it is you, it is you who is filling my mouth with your word. Surely it is you, Lord God, who is sending me forward. And so I think therein lies the difference, being honest about your weaknesses and insecurities, but not onto your own pride or your own ego or your own unbelief, but unto the glory of God. And I really love, really love that we're reminded of that. Like, we get to do this, not because we're equipped. Pastor Aaron often quotes that. It's like, you know, God equips the called. He does not call the equipped. He can use whoever he wants. He can use whoever he wants. But I love that. I love it. I love it. I love it. I fell in love with it all over again yesterday. I'm telling you, it was a blubbering mess when he called me. And I was like, this dude, I, we got to pray for our pastor because he might have lost it. <laughs> you know, there's no way that the Lord told him that dear old Frederick Cleveland Rowland from Augusta, Georgia, <laughs> is ready to deliver any kind of message to anybody. And Lord, I think for the first time in my life, I felt the gravity of trying to properly handle the Word of God. And in allowing for that to be my primary concern, God reminded me all the more. He's like, yo, it's my Word. I do the handling. I do the equipping. Lord. And so I was like, okay, God, well, clearly we keep having to have this same conversation over and over and over again. I have to keep asking you over and over and over again. How have you raised me up? How have you equipped me, Lord God? How have you worked through me, in me, around me, Lord God? What are you doing? And I think <laughs> he brings me back to 2 Chronicles seven fourteen, And I... I hmm. He remembers me, or he reminds me, rather, that he gave us the gift of repentance and he gave us the gift of prayer. When I mentioned earlier how the word turn in Second Chronicles 7, 14 jumped out at me, I was like, why is that so important? It's like, well, you know, you just recollect the story of Stephen shortly before he was stoned and how he accused or how he told the people of Jerusalem, that they were a stiff-necked people. Well, if you put two and two together, stiff-necked people cannot turn. Stiff-necked people cannot humble themselves. Stiff-necked people do not turn and face God 
Avert their eyes and look to the hills from whence cometh their help. Stiff-necked people are so concerned at what and on what they see in front of them that they refuse. There is an absolute refusal to turn. And I used to think it was so funny. It's like stiff-necked, that is a weak insult. It's so weak, but... When you think about the implications and how that very thing, one of, that led up to a man losing his life, I was like, oh my God, how much then are we to come to you and ask you these things in and of ourselves? God, where am I prideful? Where am I weak? Where am I struggling with unbelief? Where am I struggling with doubt, God? <laughs> I think it starts with us engaging the scripture the way God will allow for us to do so and how he's calling us to do so, how he's, he's commanding us to do so. Because remember, we're, we're talking about and, and reading about the children of Israel who have been there, who have seen these miraculous works, who have sat under the teaching and the guidance of a Moses, and they were still getting it wrong. And I was like, oh, wow, wow. God, I have the scriptures. I have the Old and New Testament. I can check scripture with scripture. I have all of these amazing commentaries. I have Google. I have Google. That's what I use. Let me just... Um, and so I was like, okay, God, well, let me take a step back then. It's like, let me acknowledge, God, that it is even you who gives me the desire to want to even do this the right way. God, in and of myself, I can do nothing. In and of myself, I can want nothing that you have for me. In and of myself, I fall short every single time, even with an expansive awareness of all of the things that you've given me. Even I can take that for granted. Even we can take that for granted. And so I love how God, in his exhibition of his might and in the exhibition of his love, he still calls us. To, 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 to submit and to have fellowship with him and, and commune with him and ask him questions. What are we asking God, y'all? I realize even in delivering my message today, I use a lot of I and me's. And I think as we move forward, I, I was sharing with Pastor Sherman earlier today, this is my first time ever doing anything like this. Again, I think all of them are crazy and off their rockers. But we believe in trial by fire. And so he was just like, yeah, you know, well, God calls you to do it. Get up there and do it. He's very, very. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay. You, you, you have way more or confidence in me than I do. Um, but I, I did share with him. I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm not scared. I'm not nervous. And it's not because I don't want to be. I actually tried to be. Like, I deliberately did not eat today in case, you know. <laughs> but, um. But what, what made me super excited is, you know, I know I serve a God who provides. I know I serve a God who loves. I know, a God, I know I serve a God who matures us through the process. I know that I serve a God who is a God of the process and that every particular juncture he calls what he brings us to good as long as we're submitting to his will for our lives. And so <laughs> I was like, you know, Pastor Sherman, I'm actually looking forward to, and I'm assuming prophetically speaking maybe, that this will not be my last time speaking in front of either us here at Antioch or any congregation as Lord wills it. But um, I was like, I'm, I'm looking forward to looking back to this day and seeing how I rambled and seeing how I fumbled and seeing how I tried to pray and wax eloquent and, and present myself as this, this expert in the scriptures. But it's just like, you know, I, we, we often pray together sometimes and it's like, God, show me how you've grown me. Show me how you've matured me. And I would actually encourage you all, ask God the hard questions. Ask God for brokenness. Ask God for his will for your lives. Ask God, like, don't, don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid. Don't be hesitant even even in the things that you know you're doing wrong, even in the things that you continue to just not get quite right, ask. I think the best thing that I've ever been taught to do is just to stop and ask. Not only stop and ask, but be willing to wait and be willing to listen. Quite frankly, I'm, I've come to the end of my message and I was like, oh man, you know, I don't have so much to say today. I don't know what else to say. These are all very learned and mature and blessed people. I was like, God, you know, I, I don't want to get up there and be a bubbling buffoon. But one thing that I do know about 
what we do here is we love each other and we do pray. And I know that God has covered us in prayer today. I know that God has covered, you know, our people have covered me in prayer today. I know that God has shown up and I know that God, by the power of his Holy Spirit, has met someone exactly where they are. They've heard exactly what they needed to hear. And so with that, I would love to share more. Unfortunately, I don't. I, fortunately, unfortunately, I don't know. I feel like if I keep going, I'm just going to mess it up. <laughs> If I stop right here, I still don't feel great about it, but it's been given. I love how God, even in our shortness, even in our our inadequacies, he still inclines his ear, the creator of all things, the creator who uses the earth as his footstool, the, the omnipotent and omniscient God. He inclines an ear to hear the prayers of his children. He inclines his ears to hear the questions of his children. And so with that, I just ask, you know, what are we asking God? Are we asking for our own selfish ambitions? Are we asking for the will of God to be done fully and completely in our lives? Are we asking for brokenness? Are we asking for humility? Are we asking for those things? To be quite honest, I remember there was a time where I would not ask for healing in a certain area because I felt like I was justified and being vindicated in my my wounds and in my hurt. And as I've learned to ask more boldly, I realized that God never wasted that part of my testimony. He never wasted that part of my journey. And so I feel even better now encouraging people to ask how God used certain scenarios, how God used certain parts or all parts of your testimony to get you to exactly where he has you now, even to this point where you're being reminded again to go to God for everything and ask what he is doing, why he's doing it, how he's doing it. Um, You know, just don't forget the basics. Go all the way back to the elementary education that I had to use today. It's like, you know, old book reports, I was never good at them, but I learned now that That was God's uh, will for me to learn a minute form of exegesis even back then. I always ask. Uh, And so with that, I would like to close in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your word today, Lord. We thank you that the Holy Spirit showed up and Lord God, that The people who needed to hear it heard it. The people who needed to get the scriptures got the scriptures, Lord God. They understand the truth of your word, the value of your word, Lord God, the power of your word, Lord God. Even the power with which you have endowed them, Lord God, endowed us, Lord God, to do the work that you've called for us to do. Lord God, we thank you so much again for our leadership here at Antioch, Lord God, who encourages us to continue to just dive into the word, dive into prayer, dive into service, dive into just whatever it is that God has for us, Lord God, and that in all things we are to rejoice, Lord God, in all things we are to remember to love, in all things we are to remember who you are and how you are doing things, Lord God, in our lives. Lord God, let not the brevity of my message, Lord God, be a a hindrance to anyone, Lord God. Let it be powerful, Lord God. Let it be life-giving. Let it be a charge to those of us who fail to ask, Lord God. Let it be a charge for us to remember to ask and to remember to submit and to remember to listen and to remember to make ourselves available and to remember to move as you incline us to move. Lord God, I thank you and I praise you for all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.